going to learn about making time count. Sorry, you're in the wrong room. Please go find the right room because we're going to talk about something entirely different. Um, so in creating this talk, at the beginning when I submitted the proposal, all I knew was that I wanted to create a OS app. And then after lots of iterations, I landed on another app that is not a countdown timer because that is generic, but it's still a Wear OS app, so I guess it counts. All right, so this was my initial proposal, a lot of fancy words, and the main keyword was countdown application. When I decided to start implementing that, that was no longer interesting to me because we have so many countdown timers, and if you Google countdown timer, you already get like a basic picture of timers on watches. So I decided to create something more relatable that might be more applicable to us. And that was also interesting to do because I've not seen any app like it anywhere. So you might actually be looking at the first conference app on your, on your watch, rather, in the world, maybe, at this session. All right, so for this, I decided to look around for open source apps, and I found Confetti. That is an event app created by John O'Reilly. Um, it's on GitHub, and you can check out the code. So the app has a number of interesting features, so we're going to walk through that right now. Yeah, so this is what the app looks like. There's a screenshot for Android on the left, and then on the right, there's a screenshot for the iOS version. Um, so we're just going to focus today. Of course, we're in an Android conference, so we're going to focus on the Android app. All right, so the first thing to notice is that there's a bar. So if you have a conference like DroidCon London, which is two days, you have like different tabs, one for sessions on the first day and then one for sessions on the second day. We also have a list of talks, um, one at 9, one at 9.20, with the welcome address and the speaker name. Um, and then we also see that in the same list, we have multiple talks happening at the same session, which is a common occurrence at, at conferences, right? Um, then we have the navigation. So in an app, you actually have the back button. But now that we are thinking about creating a Wear OS app, how do we translate this functionality and this navigation into a mobile device? Which I'm wearing on my right hand, by the way. Um, we have the talk title. We have the, um, we have the talk proposal, which is multiple lines. So I guess it's fine displaying this on a phone. But if you want to create this on a watch, what, how, are you, how are you going to display it? All right, we also have a couple of tags that help you identify the talk. So maybe if you click on a tag, then you see all the talks associated with that tag. And then you have the speaker details. So you have like an image, the name, and then their bio. Okay, at the bottom of the screen, you also have the schedule and different tasks for schedule and speakers. So we've seen all of that on a proper phone app. But what really, what, which of the features can we translate to a confetti wear app? Okay, anyway, um, so these are the guidelines from the official developer.android.com website for wearables. Um, they ask that you focus on one or two needs. Don't just carry the full app and then port it over to wear because you're trying to build for a small surface. Just choose one or two things that your users might need and find critical tasks that work on the wrist. Streamline the experience for the watch and don't just build like everything we just saw. Don't just copy that copy and paste into a Wear app because you want to build the Wear OS equivalent. All right, so for our first priority is like what talk is happening now and what talk is happening next. If you come to a conference, let's say like you've gone to the event website, you've selected the number of talks you want to have, you want to attend. If you have multiple talks at the same session, you already know which ones you're attending and you've done all of that. And then you attended the conference without your without your phone, but you have your watch. What do you want to see? You want to see what, com what talk is happening now. You probably want to see what talk is happening next. And then you might, so that's the first priority. For second priority, you might want to learn more about the talk you're currently viewing. And then maybe more info about the speakers like we saw in the other screenshots. And then if we have like space for extra functionality, you might want like a map to take you, let's say you're coming from Ojudu Beggar and you're trying to look for landmark, you might want to use a map to navigate to the venue. This talk is only going to be about the first priority. We're not focusing on like architecture and testing and all of that um, because that's out of scope. Um, so we're just going to walk through the first priority, the first um, priority and see how we can build a web app that reflects these two functionalities. All right, so the first thing to know is that on Wear OS, you have different surfaces. You have the notifications. We all know what notifications are, right? Um, we have, they used to be called overlays, but now they are just called apps. So they are like the normal apps you see on the Wear app. Um, so they can involve different things. They can have complications. Complications are like 
stuff that shows you, let's say you have a watch face and then you have your step counts on one part, you have maybe the weather, you have your heart rate. So those tiny little pieces of data are called complications on Wear OS. On for tiles, tiles are like entry points into your Android app. So if you've ever used widgets on your Android phone, which are like maybe a basic piece of functionality that exists in the app and then clicking into it will take you into the major functionality inside the app. So if you know what widgets are, that's what tiles are before Wear OS. And then we have the app launcher, which is like the normal icon for launching the home, the home um, screen of your Wear OS app. So I decided to go with tiles because they represent exactly what we want to do. We're looking for what talk is happening now. We're looking for what talk is happening next. So if you have a tile, you can just have like two buttons that takes you directly into whatever the current talk is and whatever the next talk is. And based on the data you filled in online, like if we're pulling data from the internet, the watch should already like have that. Although we're not going to talk about the pulling data part, but I'll just show you how this can be built. All right, so we'll first start with a mock-up or a wireframe. Um, so this is what I thought the two tiles, before I even built it, this is what I thought they might look like. Something to click into the current session and something to click into the next session. So this is an actual watch. The app is on my wrist. Um, these are two tiles. We have one happening now, and we have the next talk. So I'm going to show you how I built this. So to build tiles, we use the Horologist APIs. They're a group of libraries that supplement Wear OS developers. So if you know what Accompanist is for Jetpack Compose, Horologist is like the Wear OS version. Um, and this is this are the, this is what you have to import in your build.gradle file to use the tiles library. We need Android Studio, um, Dolphin, or Newer. Do we need Jetpack Compose? Oops. We don't need Jetpack Compose for tiles. Sorry. But just for the tiles. But we'll see where we need Jetpack Compose as we move on. All right. So this is, if there's anything you should know about building tiles for Wear OS, this is the basic thing. So you need something called the suspending tile service. This works well with Kotlin and coroutines and is like the basic service you need for every tile. In there, you have to override two functions that comes with the suspend, suspending tile service. Um, the first is resources request. So if you have like, I'm not sure if anyone has seen tiles, but sometimes you see that you can have pictures in them or icons. If you need pictures, then you need to get resources from the internet. You use the first method to do that, the first suspending function to do that. And this um, is connected to like the life cycle of the suspending tile service. If you need to build the tile layout in se itself, like this is what, this function is actually what displays um, the tile request is actually what displays the tiles, um, and the other function connects to the internet to get resources, or maybe locally from like images in Android Studio. All right, so let's dig in a little bit into that. Um, so I've commented out the other portions of the code, which I might return to. Um, but here we notice that there is like a builder function. You have to set a resources version. Resources version doesn't have to be a fancy number, it's just a number you put in Android Studio so that the cache, the cache can work properly. The important part you need to see, the arrow was pointing to the single timeline in the slide, but that's the important part we need to focus on, the single tile, tile timeline, which helps us build um, a timeline for the, for the tile. So in this, we have like a timeline builder class, and then you have to add a timeline entry, and that's where you set the layout. So inside all of this, you see that there's a tile layout on the second to the last line, and that's where the actual layout of the tile goes into. The arrow was supposed, supposed to point there, but... Um, so yeah, inside the tile layout, you have to send in a context, you need device parameters, and then you can also make the tile clickable. So if you want to click on the happening now session, which is current session, or the next session, you have to pass in like a clickable method that lets you do that. And then this is like the beginning of the actual private tile method. It contains the context, the parameters, clickable method, like we mentioned. But we're going to return a primary layout builder, which is actually where the thing is set. So if you remember, if you recall the last image of the tiles, there was like a chip at the beginning, which is happening now, which was purple. And then there was one at the bottom called next. So the one at the top is built with a compact chip. So even though something funny is happening with tiles, like even though we don't use Jetpack Compose, the libraries and APIs are actually modeled sort of after Jetpack Compose. So you have things like rows, columns, 
um, in the layer builder, which is practically the same name as the stuff we have in Jepa Compose. So it's, it's not Jepa Compose, but it's kind of like easy to learn if you know Jepa Compose. Um, so here we use a contact, contact compact chip. We have the context, we have the text, and then the clickable method. Then you can set the chip colors. So if you notice that the other app was purple, if you are used to building Jetpack Compose apps, you know that you have to have like a colors file and then a theme.kt file where you have like all your colors that you name. Um, and then for this, you can just set, there's an API called chip colors where you set the primary chip colors. That's for the happening now text, which is why it's purple. Okay, we're saying we have the chip colors, which is purple because it's set with the primary chip colors. Um, it starts with the colors from the confetti tile theme, which is very similar. If you've done Jetpack Compose, you know you probably know what I'm talking about. Um, and then for the next button, so the button at the bottom, there's actually like a div it's, that's the default chip content. If you're using, if you decide to use chips, that's the primary chip content at the bottom. So I just took advantage of that because it was the most um, similar component to what we already had in the mockups. And because I wanted the focus to be on the happening now session, I made that purple. But because I wanted, I wanted the next button to still display but not have as much attention, so I made it grayscale and created a bunch of secondary colors for those ones. Passed in the context, the title of the chip, um, the clickable and device parameters, and then we, return, we um, build that builder. Alright, so after creating your tile, your tile service and after extending suspending tile service, implementing the methods, then you need to register the service in your Android or manifest file. If you already worked with like broadcast receivers and stuff, you know that you need to register those. Um, there are a bunch of fancy things. You need to add the name, description, exported, an icon if you want. But the most important things are the permissions, um, the intent filter, and the metadata. All right, so we've discussed how to build the tiles. How do we build the session info screen? So this is what we are going to build. Um, so when you click the happening now, if you remember from one of the tiles, you are supposed to land into the main app. So this is a screenshot from the main app. This is not a tile. And this is probably what you see. Maybe a, if you go into the app from maybe an app launcher, you will see multiple of these based on all the sessions you've selected. You see like a scrollable list. But because we are clicking directly from the tile into a particular session, you're only going to see one of these because this is just one screen in the app. And ideally, if you click on this as well, it should take you into more details in an ideal world. But this is, we all know this is not an ideal situation, so that's not going to happen. Um, yeah, so how do we build this? Jetpack Compose works for this case, yay. Um, there's a lot that goes into building Compose apps, which I'm not going to talk about. But I decided to highlight the component, which I don't think exists in a proper phone um, Compose app. So we use the app card, co app card component. We have a bunch of modifiers. Um, we, have, like, we have to have the padding. And then for the app card, you have the app name, you have the time, title, um, on click. That was implemented later, and then the text. And then if you noticed on the previous screenshot, there was a happening now text happening at, um, displayed at the bottom, which was curved. Um, so for that, the, the display is actually different if you have a square or a round watch. So I, since I was focusing more on the round watch, I decided to display all the code for that instead. So you can check the configuration of your watch to see whether it's um, round or square. And then you have to have like a vowel for the title of the text, something for the primary color. Then you have a curved layout component that you can like set an anchor, anchor it to like the bottom of the screen or the beginning of the screen, um, set the modifier, and then you have the curved row, which contains a bunch of different components. So you have the curved text, which is happening now, which we already set at the beginning. We have the direction, we have the style um, and the color. And then we have like a bunch of modifiers with the curved background and you know a bunch of stuff to set a radial gradient background. All right, so how do we navigate from the tile to the app? Because we have the tile, we have the app, we've built both of them. But how do we navigate from one to the other? Um, so back to the tile layout, if you remember this from when we were talking about building tiles, we had like a bunch of methods talking about you know the clickable current session and clickable next session with a bunch of IDs. So now we're going to deep dive into a couple of important things here to see how we're going to handle the click. Um, the two important things to note here are the launch activity clickable and the 
open current session method, which is the activity that we want to open when we click on the tile. So we're just, since the two tiles actually display the same screen, I'm just going to focus on one of them. And once you can do one, um, you guys are geniuses, you'll be able to do the other one. Um, so this is what we have. This is a bunch of methods. Um, this was actually copied verbatim, I'll be honest, from the Wet West Code Lab. Because to do this, we had like a bunch of really, really detailed code labs that explained all the steps. So I just put, in order to build this demo, I just pulled a couple of things um, from some of them. And in there, we had like the modifiers, builders, um, modifiers, builders, builder, which you set an ID because here we had, we had the clickable ID for current session. Um, we set that and then we set on click to launch an Android activity. Okay, so what does the open current session method do? So um, the action builders builder sets like a confetti wear activity and then we have a bunch of key to extra mappings that just make sure that you are opening the like you are opening the actual screen that you want to open. And then if you want to do something specific in that screen, then you use the intent. The same way we use intent on Android to like pass data between screens. You can use the intent to customize whatever text or whatever thing you want to be displayed on that activity. Yeah, so we're gonna focus a bit on the set confetti wear activity. So inside this we are just returning the package name of the entire wear app which for some reason is Defless Lagos Wear App. And then we're going to set the class name. Here we're opening main activity, and the main activity is in the presentation package. So it's just like, if you're an Android dev, this, are familiar, this should all be familiar things um, to you. OK, now we've built, unfortunately, we did not see the click happen. But now we've built the app. How do we debug it? The easiest way is to go to device managers on Android Studio and then create a Wear OS emulator. That, was, uh, that works out of the box. You don't need to do anything extra. Um, but what if you actually have like a Wear OS device and you want to debug? Because what's the fun of having the watch if you can't test on it, right? Um, so I was going through the developer documentation um, and actually didn't find the step that I wanted to do. So this is probably the first time you see this anywhere as well. So you're seeing a lot of new stuff in this in this talk. Um, so you can debug over Bluetooth. Um, when I checked the documentation, there were a bunch of stuff involving like ADB configuration. I think that was for the debug over Wi-Fi. Um, but that was for debug over Wi-Fi. The details are in the link below, how to get started with debugging. But what I actually want to focus on, which I did not find documentation for, is wireless debugging. Um, if you debug with your phones on Android Studio, you might know how to do this already, where you connect with a code. Um, but because this is Wear OS and it's new, probably new to a lot of us, I'm going to walk through the steps in detail. So you need to enable developer options on the watch. So you set in system about, um, you have to click the build number seven times on the watch as well. And here it shows like I was one step away from being a developer and yay, got the text. That was the first step. Um, second step was to connect the watch to a Wi-Fi network, um, which should be easy to do. But the important thing to note here is that the network the watch is connected to must be the same network your machine is, your laptop is connected to. And then retrieve the Wi-Fi pairing code from the watch. So if you've if you've debugged, if you've done wireless debugging with the phone, you've probably done this step before. Um, so settings, developer options, wireless debugging, and then once you um, click that check mark. It it um, populates. It gives you lots more options um, where you can pair a new device. And when you click on that, it gives you a code which you enter into Android Studio. You need to use the code in Android Studio. So you go to pair devices using Wi-Fi, and then enter the code you got from your watch. And then you'll see a confirmation screen that your watch is connected. And once you do that, you can run apps directly from Android Studio wirelessly without any wires or setting ADB configs or whatever, and you get the apps on your phone, on your watch rather. When I was creating this, I spoke to a bunch of people. A couple of people might know Atu. He's like a Wear OS DevRel at Google. Um, he was very involved. Hopefully, if I've picked your interest and you want to learn more about Wear OS, you can go to the developer.android.com slash Wear site. Um, you can also check out the GitHub, Android Wear OS, Compose, Advanced Samples. Um, the, the Compose Advanced Samples are really detailed and like all the information there is what I was able to use to build the demo I was hopefully going to show you, which I couldn't show you because the GIFs did not display. Um, 
Yeah, any questions? Um, learning Kotlin for Android. So, um, I'm new here, so I want to know if um, I'm on the right track or because some persons are saying I should learn Flutter. So I want to know if Flutter is best for Android or I could continue my learning or I could learn Kotlin first, then when I'm done I could go to Flutter. I see what you're trying to do here, if Flutter versus Android world. Well, that's not going to work. Tell whoever sent you that I wasn't here. Just joking. Um, I am always biased towards purely native apps. So the only answer you're going to hear from me is to learn Kotlin. Um, and the thing is, like, you don't always, you don't only need Kotlin for Android. You can use Kotlin for the web. You can use Kotlin multi-platform and somehow get it to work with um, iOS apps. Um, I guess you can do the same. I'm not sure what like the actual performance difference is between Flutter and Kotlin multi-platform if you're thinking about multiple platform apps because that's the only reason you should use Flutter to build an Android app. Um, but I will always, my own biased answer is very biased. You might get something different. So there's no reason. Just for me, it's like, just do Android if you want. Um, go completely native and learn Kotlin. And Kotlin is a really nice language to learn, to be honest. I'm not going to diss on that, but if you've used it, you know what I'm saying. Um. All right, thank you very much. <laughs>